Welcome to part four of evidence-based practice, documentation, informatics, and teaching. This is our last portion and it is on teaching. So nurses do a lot of teaching. We teach more than we even realize. Every time we explain something to our patients or to the family, we're teaching. A lot of teaching that we do is informal interactions, impromptu conversations, discussing medications or lab results, or even teaching them what we're doing to them. Sometimes our teaching needs to be a little bit more formal with this, like discharge teaching or teaching about medical equipment or even teaching a diabetic how to give themselves insulin injections. These more formal teaching situations require planning by the nurse to ensure that learning actually takes place. So what exactly is learning? Learning is the act of acquiring knowledge, attitude, and skills. Teaching is what someone does to help another person learn. As nurses, we do what is called health education. Health education is directed towards the promotion, maintenance, and restoration of patients' health, preventing illness, and helping people adapt to the residual effects of illness. Teaching health education is an essential function of nursing, and it's even part of our ANA scope and standards of practice. Health education can teach people how to do self-care or teach family members how to care for their loved ones. It can be educating people to support their informed decision-making. We can teach patients how to adhere to their treatments. We teach people how to maintain their health and how to prevent illness. We teach people how to cope with whatever life is thrown at them. So many things we do and teach as nurses fit into all of these areas of health education. There are three learning domains that we need to be aware of. The first domain is cognitive. Cognitive learning is storing and recalling new knowledge in the brain. Then we have psychomotor learning, which is when you learn a physical skill. And effective learning is when attitudes and values and feelings change. Teaching a new diabetic would involve all three of those domains as we're teaching them new information about the disease and their treatments. We're gonna affect their psychomotor domain when we teach them how to draw up and administer their insulin. And we teach them effectively when we work with them to change their diet and focus on preventing complications that could kill them. There are many factors that affect teaching and learning. The first is age and developmental level. Think back to psychology when you learned about Erickson's stages of psychosocial development. Each stage a person is in has its own good qualities and bad qualities, and we need to be mindful of these stages when we teach our patients. The older people get, the more health issues they have, and they're also developing sensory issues that can affect how they learn. We also need to be mindful of Maslow and his hierarchy. People cannot move up Maslow's hierarchy until their basic needs are met. This means they cannot learn if they are not safe, fed, and cared for. We also need to take into account the person's support system and who will be caring for that person when they don't have a nurse right in front of them. Finances are also a factor when it comes to learning and can relate back to Maslow. Culture and language absolutely affect a person's learning and a lot of that goes back to communication. Lastly, we have health literacy. Health literacy is how much a person knows about health to begin with, how well they can read health information given to them, and how well they can find health information to make decisions about their health. Most people in America have very low health literacy, and social media has made that even worse with the misinformation that's available. Block one focuses on the care of adults and older adults, so I want to mention older adults a little bit more in depth. Older adults have more medications, more health problems, and more sensory problems. So we as nurses need to make sure we identify those issues as potential barriers to learning. If we have to teach our patients how to draw up insulin and the patient is blind, how are we gonna do that? We also need to allow extra time for learning for cognitive and sensory issues, as well as plan for each teaching session to be short so we don't exhaust the patient. We may also need to relate new information to familiar activities or information to help with memory recall. We also need to assess their support system as they may not have living spouses or children living nearby to help them. Culture and communication is just a part of what we need to know about culture. 
When we teach a person whose culture is different than ours, we need to make an attempt to understand their culture. If we try and understand, then we don't have barriers like eye contact and touching. We also may learn that treatments we suggest are completely different than what their culture would do and they may not follow our treatments. As nurses, we must be aware that our own personal assumptions and biases and prejudice when we teach. We can never assume the person understands or doesn't understand based on their reaction as their culture reactions may be different than ours. We also need to know what our biases and prejudice are and to not use those to affect the teaching we provide. We may need to develop written educational material that's on that person's preferred language so they can read it and understand it so they can follow it. Imagine trying to give yourself an insulin injection when you can't read the directions. Lastly, you may need to use an interpreter to help translate the information. We do not use family members or friends to translate as we have no idea what they're actually telling the patient. Sometimes they tell them what they think the patient wants to hear, not what we're telling them. Healthcare is obligated to provide a certified interpreter, so please use one. If you are bilingual but are not certified, do not interpret. You can communicate, but you cannot interpret. Just like the nursing process, the first step we need to do when we're gonna teach our patients is assess them. We need to identify what their learning needs are. We might be tasked with teaching a patient about insulin and we come up with this huge teaching plan that we spent a lot of time on only to find out that the patient's a medical doctor and already knows 90% of the information we're gonna teach. Or we may assume that the patient knows they need to wash their hands often to prevent infection and we find out they don't even know what an infection is or how to even wash their hands. We must also assess their learning readiness. Do they have the ability to learn at that moment in time? We also need to assess how the person learns the best, although a lot of what we teach is hands-on. We must also consider the person's motivation for learning. If the person has no motivation to learn, they will not learn. Or maybe they just haven't been given the right motivation yet. You might die is actually a really good motivator. After we assess our patient's learning needs, we need to plan our goals and outcomes, just like the nursing process. This is when we develop our teaching plan, what we're going to teach, and how we're going to teach it. We need to take our patient's goals and expectations and how they prefer to learn into consideration. That being said, that does not mean that we don't teach insulin injections because the patient is scared of needles. We still have education that we have to provide, we just want the patient's preferences involved. There are many strategies to teach information. Lecture and discussion is the easiest and most commonly used method, but it's not perfect for all situations. It's become commonplace due to ease. Panel discussions work well in certain settings, but they're not likely to be used in most healthcare situations. Demonstration is one of the most important methods in healthcare because taking care of the body requires some sort of physical action. Role playing is a great way to prepare for difficult conversations. And one of the greatest methods we have for reinforcing information today is electronic resources. There are so many apps and programs and online support for every disease, and it really helps reinforce information when we're not there. Some of the teaching materials we use include audio visuals like videos and printed information like brochures and directions. And then of course, we use a lot of web-based instruction and technology. One thing we must remember when it comes to how and what we're gonna teach is to make sure that it's appropriate for the person we're teaching. We need to make sure the reading level is appropriate. America averaged about the fifth grade reading level. So we need to make sure that what they're able to access and what materials we're given are appropriate for them. And if we're giving them something that's web-based, we have to make sure they have internet at home. We need to make sure that we teach them how to get on the internet if they don't know what to do. And we need to make sure that we're teaching them how they want to be taught. If you give me personally a book to read about a disease, I'm not going to read it. If you give me a video, I'll probably watch it, but I'm not gonna read a book. 
The environment we teach in is very important. For most nurses, teaching is gonna incur in a healthcare setting, so we get very limited on where we can teach. Most teaching nurses will do is gonna be informal because we're in the patient's room doing the teaching. But some nurses do present formally, like at conferences for patients or in hospital auditoriums for the community. We also need to look at the physical environment. Is the room temperature too warm or too cold? Is the room well lit or is it dark? Is there a lot of background noise or is it quiet? All of this matters when it comes to teaching our patients. We need them to focus on what we're teaching and not being distracted by the environment. We also need to be mindful of what time we plan to teach. We don't wanna teach them during breakfast time when they're focused on eating and we don't wanna teach them right after they worked out hard with physical therapy when they're in pain and they're tired. We also want to make sure that any support person for the patient can be present as well. I always suggest teaching family the same things that you're going to teach the patient. Each person is going to remember some different aspects of what you're teaching and maybe between the both of them, everything they need to know will be remembered. Also, I've had plenty of patients tell me they never received education and the family members like, no, wait a minute, you were educated, I was there. When we teach our patients, we want them to follow what we're telling them and continue to do it so they have the best health outcomes. Sometimes this is hard, especially when you have to teach someone to stop doing something or stop eating something that they love. Getting our patients to follow what we're teaching them is called adherence. You may have heard the term compliance before, and it's a similar idea, but compliance often has a negative connotation because it really means to follow orders. We're not ordering our patients to do anything, we're teaching them to do the best thing for their bodies. They have free will and they can do what they want. The best way to get a person to adhere to the teaching we give them is to make sure the goals are mutual. Make sure we're using teaching strategies that work best for the patient. We also wanna make sure that we're engaging and motivating while being sincere and honest. We need to avoid giving too much detail and just stick to the basics. We have a lot of knowledge in our brains and we can be overwhelming. And they don't know the terms we do, so we need to make sure that we're using simple words. We need to allow enough time for questions and we need to make sure the environment is conducive to learning and free from interruptions. The room being too hot or too cold, too noisy or too busy, all affects whether a patient can pay attention. If the environment's distracting, no learning is gonna occur. And then we also wanna make sure that when we teach the patient is a good time for the patient. Besides the actual teaching affecting adherence, we have other factors that affect a person's ability to adhere to what we're teaching them. One is their demographic variables, their age, their gender, their socioeconomic status. Can they see what they need to do? Can they afford the medications or will they have to choose between medications and food? We need to look at how sick they are. The sicker the person is, the harder time they will have at maintaining their issues and adhering to what we're teaching them. We also need to look at the therapy itself. Does it have any bad side effects that may make a person want to stop? Does it cause a person to not be able to go to work? If they can't go to work, they don't make money and they're going to lose their insurance benefits is what we're teaching them against their beliefs. Also, what's their health literacy? Do they have the knowledge or ability to get the knowledge so they can adhere to it? Do they know what to do if there's an issue? Can they even recognize that there's an issue? It's very easy for healthcare workers to say, oh, this person's non-compliant with their diabetes treatment, but look at all these factors that affect their ability. Adherence is not an easy choice to make. All of these things affect them. Just like the nursing process, we have to evaluate our teaching and document it. When we evaluate our teaching, we're evaluating the patient's goals, but also how we taught and our methods for teaching. Were the videos helpful or not? Was the timing of our teaching good or did we choose a bad time and it didn't work out well at all? Part of evaluation is reinforcing what we taught. Patient teaching is not a one-time thing and we reinforce that over and over and over again. Sometimes we need to revise our teaching plan and try something else. 
Maybe hands-on demonstration did not work out well for our patient who was scared of needles, so we might need to revise our plan and teach the family how to give the injections. Just like the nursing process, we're constantly evaluating and revising our plan until the goals are met. And with documentation, just like with the EMR, if we don't chart our education, it wasn't done. So we need to document the summary of the learning needs. Why did we need to educate them? We need to document the teaching plan and how we implemented the plan. We also need to document the evaluation of the results we obtained. How did the patient respond to our teaching? Everything related to the teaching plan has to be documented. And this is the end of part four.